Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. This is our first video in a series of videos on the brain. And in video A here, we will focus on neurulation. In other words, the development of the brain and the spinal cord. Before we look at how our brain develops, let's just discuss some general information and uh, ensure that all of us are correct about how we think about our brain, particularly with regards to the size of our brain. Uh, the male and female brain size is about three to three and a half pounds, and there's really not much of a difference. The difference lies in the change in the body mass between a male and a female. Another important thing to remember about our brain is that we can literally cut it in half, and therefore we have two anatomically uh, identical halves. Now, when we take a look at the functions of those halves, they're not perfectly identi identical. So the brain is anatomically bilaterally symmetrical, but not so much at a physiological level. There is some terminology that we first need to make sure we're very familiar with. For one, I think all of you guys know by now that the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord but that means that everything else in the nervous system is part of what we refer to as the peripheral nervous system. And we will spend time discussing the peripheral nervous system and particularly the autonomic nervous system, um, which is part of your peripheral nervous system, uh, after we're done with discussing the brain and the spinal cord. In the central nervous system, we're going to point out regions that are collections of cell bodies, and the, then we will refer to them as nuclei. So the term nucleus has been used uh, for several different things. So, so let's take a closer look at this real quick. In chemistry, you learned that an atom has a nucleus in its very center, You've also learned that cells have a nucleus that contains the DNA. And as I said, a collection of cell bodies in the brain or the spinal cord, we also refer to as a nucleus. And nuclei are going to typically appear as gray matter in our brain and spinal cord. So what do we mean by gray matter? And gray matter includes only cell bodies, and unmyelinated axons. When myelinated axons are present, then the nervous tissue has more of a whitish color and we refer to it as white matter. So when we look at the brain here, then we clearly see two distinct colors. So we see this very convoluted outer layer of the brain and that stains more of a like a beigeous, grayish beigeish, that is what we call gray matter. And then notice the much wider region here, which is the white matter. So the white matter stains whitish because the myelin in the myelin, myelinated axons <clears throat> uh, gives that color to the nervous tissue. So once again, a collection of cell bodies inside of the central nervous system we call a nucleus. Now, we have collections of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system, but then we should correctly call them a ganglion and plural ganglia. Remember, for instance, that the cell bodies of all sensory neurons collect just outside of the central nervous system, for instance, just outside of the spinal cord. And so those are referred to as um, sensory ganglia. Finally, you've heard of the term nerve, right? The term nerve is really only applied to the nervous system and it's an organ, an organ that is made up of bundles and bundles of axons. Now, when we have bundles and bundles of axons inside of the central nervous system, we call them tracts. So a tract and a nerve are analogous to one another, except they are present in different parts of the nervous system. For instance, let's take a look here at a really good example that illustrates this, this terminology. For instance, from the back of your eyeballs are going to arise all kinds of axons. Axons 
that carry the, 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 the stimuli, the light stimuli that were converted to action potentials, those action potentials are carried by many, many axons towards the brain. So as these axons leave the back of the eyeball, their bundles are present in an optic nerve, an optic nerve. So this is the optic nerve. Even though it looks like we're in the brain, we're not really in the brain yet. Once these nerves cross over, we're right at the entry point of uh, the brain. And notice then that we refer to the remainder of the bundles of axons as the optic tracts. So far this semester in Anatomy and Physiology 1, we have studied only a few organ systems. The integumentary system, the skeletal system, as well as the muscular system. And particularly for the skeletal system and a little bit for the muscular system, we discussed some embryology. And we're going to now do this for the nervous system as well, because it's quite fascinating how our brain and spinal cord and then also the peripheral nervous system develops. So let's take a look. So in the upper right hand corner, the very top right hand corner right here, you see what an embryo, lo embryo looks like. This is what you and I looked like at one point in time at about 19 days. And it just looks like this little oblong little blob if we now slice through it, if we just make this transverse section, then we begin to recognize that it's already um, differentiated into the ectoderm, the outer layer here, and the reddish layer, the mesoderm, and then the endoderm in the light blue. And pretty soon that ectoderm is going to start to invaginate. Um, but I'd like to slow things down a little bit. So we're going to um, take this figure and actually enlarge it. And then we get to this figure next. So again, this is the ectoderm. It has now multiple colors to indicate that cells are beginning to differentiate and move. And then in the reddish here, we see the mesoderm. The notochord is a structure that eventually will give rise to such things as the vertebrae, the vertebral column. So what's going to happen at about 19 days is that cells in the ectoderm begin to thicken and in particularly in this area right here nearby that notochord and therefore for what we call the neural plate. At the same time, we're going to then soon see that that neural plate begins to invaginate. You already start to see that happening here, and that becomes more and more pronounced here. Now, there are going to be cells that sit right between that invaginating part and the remainder of the ectoderm, and they're colored in the bright green. Those are referred to as our neural crest cells. So we're now forming a neural groove and at the, the flanks of our neural groove are becoming neural crest cells. Now eventually this neural groove is going to close off and form a neural tube. Now keep in mind what the original look of our embryo is. So don't forget that it really kind of looks like this structure that we've started out with at the very top right. So don't f forget to think of this three-dimensionally. Now interestingly enough, this neural tube as it seals itself off, notice that these bright green neural crest cells, which are again further differentiated ectodermal cells, have slipped in between the remaining ectoderm in the blue and the neural tube. And these neural crest cells are going to make a good portion of our peripheral nervous system. The neural tube, on the other hand, is going to turn into our brain and spinal cord. So if we take it one step further, again, here we see our neural tube. You see how it's following the length of our 
uh, embryo. The ectoderm is mostly going to become our epidermis of our skin, by the way. Notice that the neural crest cells have continued to slip deeper into the embryo and now are sitting on either side as cylinders uh, of the neural tube. And so, of course, our brains do not look like these tubes. Our brains and spinal cords don't look like these long tubes. Our spinal cord does, but not at all our brain. So still a lot needs to happen. So the formation of that neural tube occurs in about the second week of, of pregnancy. But by the time we get to the third to fourth week, notice that the neural tube is going to start enlarging, meaning lots of cell divisions are taking place. And we're going to see these three major bulges and we'll call these brain vesicles. The remainder here of our tube will eventually become the spinal cord, but these, these three primary brain vesicles will ultimately become our brain, believe it or not. And they get interesting names. In English, we can refer to them as the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. But you should also know their scientific names, that is the prosencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhombencephalon. A five-week embryo has even more of these vesicles, and then we will refer to them as secondary brain vesicles, and there are five of them. And so this time we have the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, notice that the name mesencephalon remains, the metencephalon, and the myelencephalon. What's important is that you recognize which ones of these brain vesicles, particularly which ones of these primary brain vesicles, ultimately gives rise to which more mature portion of the brain. For instance, notice that the forebrain or the prosencephalon, which is in this grayish color, will ultimately give rise to, as I said, the telencephalon and diencephalon, but when it comes to the more mature structures, it is going to be the cerebrum, the eye cup, and the, and the diencephalon parts, which are the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, as we'll learn later on. So you'll need to come back to this particular slide to make the connection between your three primary brain vesicles and what ultimately is given rise to in the more mature brain. Again, we're looking here at a frontal view when we point out these bulges, but it's important for you to also compare that frontal view to the lateral view at three to four weeks at a three to four week embryo. And here's the other lateral view for a five week embryo. This is sort of kind of sort of kind of sort of <laughs> beginning to look like a brain but still it, it looks rather uh, wormy almost. Um, so let's try to figure out what still needs to happen to it. You do see that it begins to, to literally flex upon itself. So we see these flexion areas occurring. So a mature brain is going to look like this and literally that little worm-like structure we were looking at in the previous picture is going to continue, continue to flex upon itself and continue to expand by lots of cell division. And then it's going to become very crinkly because it needs to fit in our skull. And that's why we see lots of wrinkles in our brain. And we will give those wrinkles names in the next slide but we ultimately end up with four major regions. We have in the blue and the light blue, what we call the cerebrum. We have 
a smaller version of a cerebrum better referred to as the cerebellum, which always sits on the posterior side of our brain. So the cerebellum always sits posterior. Then we have in the very deep center of the brain this lime green region, which we call the diencephalon. That's where the thalamus and hypothalamus are located. I'm sure you've heard of those structures. And the brain stem is indicated by this double-headed arrow, uh, including the, the, the green, the blue, and the purplish region. So that's the brain stem. So we have a total of four major regions again, cerebrum, cerebellum, diencephalon, and brain stem. So I hope you have gained some respect here for how incredible it is how a neural tube can become this rather complex looking organ, um, the brain in our human body.